Welcome to the Feed Your Family Tonight podcast. Do you dread hearing the question, what's for dinner? Whether you spend your days keeping up with toddlers, running kids to after school activities, or juggling a career and family, getting dinner on the table can be a struggle for us all. I'm Marie Feebach, a business owner, wife, and mom of four. I'm on a mission to build stronger families one dinner at a time, and I'm here with tips, tricks, and inspiration you need to feed your family tonight. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Feed Your Family Tonight podcast, episode 179. I'm your host, Marie Feebach. Happy to be here with you today. Today is actually a replay episode. I am replaying my episode on how to cook ground beef. Friends, I bet you aren't doing it the way I teach in this episode. There are some really surprising things that will make your ground beef taste better, have more flavor. So sit back, listen to this replay episode and learn how to have better ground beef. Ground beef is pretty ubiquitous in American families. It's something that is simple. It's pretty inexpensive. But I have been talking with a lot of friends lately, and I've been finding that there are little things that I do that are a little different than what other people are doing when they cook ground beef that create just better results. And so I'm going to kind of take a deep dive into ground beef today. It's going to be the first of a series. We're going to talk about chicken next week because I think there's just some small little things that may make your dinner either a little bit easier or perhaps even taste just a little bit better. And I'm all about things that are easier and taste better. So today we're just going to talk a little bit about ground beef. I can't wait to hear if maybe you learned one little tip or had one little aha moment where maybe it's something that you weren't thinking that you were doing. And now you realize, yes, I do that. And that is why it tastes better kind of listen as we go today about something that is either new or something that you're like, yeah, I already do that. Maybe that's why it tastes good. (laughs) When we talk about ground beef, the first thing we need to talk about is thawing meat. I've talked about frozen meat before, but it needs to be said because so oftentimes, especially if you're like me and you get your beef from a local farmer, it's coming to you frozen and we need to talk about thawing it. Of course, always the best way to thaw meat is slowly in the refrigerator. I have found that one pound of ground beef takes a little bit longer than a day in my jam-packed refrigerator to get fully thawed. So when you are doing your weekly meal planning sheets and you know that you're having something with ground beef and you're using ground beef from your freezer, you might want to take it out two days in advance. So write that on the prep section of your weekly meal planning sheet, two days before the meal that you're going to cook it. If you don't have a copy of the weekly meal planning sheet, you can get it free at feedyourfamilytonight.com slash plan. And if you find that you are using that weekly meal planning sheet and it really works for you, you probably want to look at getting the meal planning notebook. It's on Amazon. I will link it in the show notes here. But if you type in feed your family tonight meal planning notebook, it'll come up on Amazon. It is $12. Sometimes Amazon, they've been running sales on it. I've seen it as low as $8. To have the sheets already there in a notebook ready for you just makes meal planning a little bit easier. But enough about that. We're going to come back to talking about thawing beef. So if you have one pound of ground beef, you want to give it two days in your refrigerator to thaw. If you are anything like me, sometimes we forget to do the things that we're supposed to do when it comes to thawing meat and it's five o'clock at night and you have a pound of frozen ground beef. What do you do? Well, microwave is your friend. I have a setting on my microwave, which is a one pound defrost. It takes like two or three minutes. I usually just put the beef in, click that button And it usually gets the outer part thawed and then there's still a little bit of the inner part. So I kind of peel off the part that's thawed, put the inner part back in for another 30 seconds and call it quits. Anytime you are thawing meat in the microwave, you want to make sure that you are cooking it promptly. You don't want meat to be heated up to a dangerous temperature and then just put it back in the refrigerator. So if you are using the microwave, make sure that you're cooking it promptly. 
another way, if you think about it at like lunchtime or earlier in the afternoon, you can put it in a bowl of cold water in your sink and just change the water every 30 minutes. And that will usually get it to thaw well. Those are both safe ways to thaw ground beef. Once you've got your meat thawed, we're going to talk about several ways to cook ground beef. And the first one is just browning it. So this is when you are browning it to make tacos or you're browning it to make chili or my tater tot casserole or cheeseburger baked potatoes. You're just cooking the ground beef through. There's a couple of things that you want to do to enhance the flavor of the ground beef that you cook it. The first thing is that you want to put the ground beef in the pan and kind of spread it out into a flat disc all the way to the corners of the pan. I have a nice 10 inch skillet and I can usually do two, maybe three pounds of ground beef in my 10 inch skillet before it gets to be too much. You're going to put it in the pan. You're going to turn the pan on medium high and you're not going to touch the beef, but you are going to salt it. The rule of thumb for ground beef is about three quarters of a teaspoon to one teaspoon of salt per pound of beef. And the reason I have kind of a range there, the first thing is if you are using table salt, you definitely want to go closer to three quarters, maybe even a half. I like to use that coarse sea salt. So it's a little bit higher in volume, but lower in sodium. If you are doing something where you are adding other ingredients to the ground beef, then you can go with the higher salt level because the salt is going to kind of thin out. If you're doing just the ground beef straight, kind of like in cheeseburger baked potatoes, you might want to go lower. You can always add more salt later, but it's important to have the meat salted as it cooks. When you're using beef that isn't ground, it's even better to salt it like a day ahead of time so the salt has a chance to penetrate deep into the meat. There's something that happens when you put salt on meat, it immediately draws the moisture out of the meat, but then as it sits, the moisture goes back into the meat. So you either want to salt the meat right before you cook it, or when you're using large cuts of meat, you want to salt it a few days ahead of time. With ground beef, it's best just to salt it right before cooking or right when you start cooking it. But don't wait until after it's cooked to add the salt because the salt isn't going to have a chance to penetrate deep into the meat and it's going to taste a little bit bland. So it's really important to salt your meat. I cannot tell you how many of my friends I've talked to. I was shooting video at a friend's house. We were cooking some beef for cheeseburger baked potatoes. And I said, okay, well, now we need to add some salt. And she was like, salt? I don't salt the meat. And I was like, oh my gosh, you've got to salt your meat. So that's a really big thing. Salt your meat, peoples. It's probably time for another episode on salt. Maybe I'll have to add that to the queue because salt is so important to having deep flavor. Okay, so kind of back to this ground beef. I've got a little off track there, but it's important because I want to talk about salt. You have it spread out into your skillet and it is kind of in a disc there and you turn the heat on medium high heat And then I said, don't touch it. And when I say don't touch it, I mean, just let it cook there for like five to seven minutes. And your nose is going to tell you, you're going to start smelling it and it's going to start cooking. And then you're going to leave it alone just a little bit longer. It takes a little bit of patience, but what you're doing is you are creating the Malheur reaction, which is a chemical term for when the meat browns and you're going to kind of lift up the edge of the meat and see if you have a nice, thick, brown crust. If you don't have a nice, thick, brown crust, step away and don't touch your meat and keep it cooking until the bottom part has a nice, thick, brown crust. And then you can take your spatula and you can kind of cut it into chunks and flip it over so that the other side of the meat starts to cook. Or you can get one of these gadgets. I do not have one, so I cannot say that I have personally used one, but I will link to one that a food blogger I really, really trust recommends. It's called a chop and stir, and it looks kind of like a pinwheel almost on the end of a stick, and you use it to cut the meat into smaller chunks. If one of you have one of them, let me know how you like it. Again, I haven't used one, but I've heard they're wonderful. So you flip it and you start chopping it into smaller pieces. 
when you use this technique, you're going to get a really deep, beefy flavor from that browning that happens on that crust that you get on the bottom. But you are going to end up with chunks of meat that are a little bit bigger. My family prefers it that way. But if you like meat that's really, really soft, think like the taco meat that you get at Taco Bell. If you like your meat to be really soft, then this other technique for cooking ground beef is going to be better for you. And that is to cook it in water. So instead of putting the meat into a skillet, you could use a skillet for this, but you could also use a pot. And I usually use a pot for this technique because I'm usually going to be flavoring the meat afterwards and I want to have enough room. But you put the meat in the bottom of the pan and you kind of take a spatula or one of those chop and stirs and kind of cut it into smaller chunks Then you cover the meat with water, bring the water up to a boil, and then slowly turn it down to a simmer and let the meat simmer. As it is simmering, you're going to want to stir it every two or three minutes and start breaking the meat down into smaller pieces. And as it cooks in the water, you're going to get this really soft meat. Now, remember I said salt it. You want to salt this water, but you don't want to oversalt it. So we're kind of back to that three quarters of a teaspoon to one teaspoon per pound of meat. You're going to add that salt and let that cook in that salty water. The meat is going to simmer for 20 or 30 minutes and it's going to get a really soft texture and you're going to get smaller pieces of meat. So if that's the texture that you desire, you want to cook it in water. Now in both cases, the percentage of fat in your meat is going to dictate whether or not you need to drain off fat. I usually order my meat from our butcher pretty lean, so it doesn't have very much fat in it. And so I usually don't have to drain off fat. But if you are ordering meat or buying meat, that is a higher percentage of fat. And really lean meat is like 95 to 99% lean moderate is about 85% lean, 15% fat. And then you start getting into fattier cuts, which are 70% lean, 30% fat. If you're in the 70 to 85, you're probably going to want to drain off some of the fat. You will thank me for this. Do not pour fat down your sink because eventually over time, it probably won't do it the first time or the second time or the fifth time, but someday when it's a holiday, your pipes are going to clog and you're going to have to call a plumber and he's going to say, have you been pouring fat down your sink? And you're going to sheepishly say, yeah, and he's going to chastise you. So do not get chastised by your plumber. Do not pour fat down your sink. When you are draining off fat, if you have the water in there, the fat is going to bubble to the top of the water and you can use a spoon to kind of skim off the top of the fat. If you have a skillet and there's just fat on the edges, you can tilt the skillet up and use a spoon to slowly scoop it out. Or you could put a paper towel inside of a colander, put the colander on top of a plate or a bowl and pour the meat into the colander. The paper towel is going to absorb most of the fat and any of it else is going to drip onto the plate or into the bowl. And then you can return the meat back to your skillet to finish whatever you are doing with the cooked ground beef. Some of my favorite recipes that use ground beef that are cooked by either of these two methods, depending upon the texture that you want are cheeseburger baked potatoes, tater tot casserole, and my classic chili. And I'll link to all of those in the show notes. So we've kind of talked about how to cook ground beef when you're just browning it for recipes. The second way that we're going to talk about ground beef is the classic hamburger. Now our family eats a lot of burgers in the summer. There are several different ways to cook burgers, including grilling, broiling, and pan frying. And I'm going to talk about all three of those in a little bit. There are also three kind of main ways to deal with the meat as you form them into patties. And we're going to start with that. The first way that you can make hamburger into patties is to take the ground beef and shape it into patties without any seasonings, without any additives. This is going to give you a very beefy tasting burger, but it's not going to have a lot of residual flavor. 
oftentimes when you have that type of a patty where it's just beef, like the ones that you buy pre-made in the grocery store, you are going to want to season those with a minimum of salt and pepper on both sides as you cook them. But a lot of people like my father will doctor them up with like seasoned salt or garlic salt or something to add more flavor to just this slab of meat without any flavor. Camp two of how to make your hamburger patties is a recipe that came originally from Cook's Illustrated and they made a panade to mix with the beef to make an extra juicy burger that could be cooked fully through. To have a burger that is super juicy, the experts, quote unquote, experts would say that you don't want to cook it to fully well done. Now we cook ours to fully well done because that's how we do it. That's how we're used to eating it. But they aren't super juicy that way. And so they created this technique where you made a panade. A panade is something that is usually used for meatloaf or meatballs, which we are going to talk about later. But I'm going to talk about the panade here first. A panade is a mixture usually of bread and liquid. The liquid is usually milk because the milk has a little bit of fat and protein in it. And you mix the bread or breadcrumbs with the milk, and it creates this kind of gelatinous paste that you mix with the beef. And that adds moisture to the meat, which gives you the mouthfeel of juiciness in your hamburger. I have made these burgers with Cook's Illustrated where you mix salt and pepper and some spices in this panade and mix it with the ground beef. And it makes a really good burger. It makes an extra juicy burger. I will talk a little bit about making burgers ahead, the patties and freezing them. I have done this technique with frozen patties and it totally works. This is a really good way to get a juicy burger is to mix it with a panade. My favorite way to make burgers is the Feed Your Family Tonight Make Ahead hamburger patty recipe. And it uses egg and garlic powder and onion powder and salt. And why egg? I I don't really know the science behind it, if you want to be honest. But my father always used an egg when he made hamburger patties. And it helps them stay together. And it gives them some moisture. I feel like it's kind of the same idea as that panade where you're adding a little bit of fat from the egg yolk, you're getting a little bit of protein from the egg white. And it makes really great burgers. My make ahead burgers, I usually make in a large batch in the late spring, early summer, and I will make dozens of patties and I will freeze them on sheets of parchment paper. And then after they're frozen solid, I will put them into zip baggies. And all summer long, I pull out these frozen burgers that I put on my grill straight frozen. It's just so easy and so convenient to have hamburgers, which is one of our family's favorite meals. And that is how I like to do that. I will link to my recipe in the show notes for you. Now, we've talked about how we form the patties. Now we're going to talk about how to cook the patties. When you cook the patties, you can grill them, you can broil them, or you can pan fry them. Broiling is a mess. I really don't see the point in it. If you are a diehard broiler fan, be my guest. But I'm going to focus on grilling with a gas grill and pan frying. Now, if you like charcoal, I'm not your gal because I just don't know how to work with charcoal. So if you are a charcoal person, reply in the comments of the blog post because I would love to hear about charcoal, but I know how to use gas. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Stick with what you know, friends. Gas grills need to be preheated. You want to preheat your gas grill for at least 10 to 15 minutes before. Turn all the burners on turn them all on high and get your gas grill screaming hot. And then you want to clean your grill with a wireless grill brush. Now, this is my public service announcement to you. We had a friend of the family. If you know grill brushes, they usually are little tiny wires that are on a long handle that you use to scrape off anything that has accumulated on the grill. And the easiest way to do it is right before you grill the next food, when the grill is screaming hot, you just scrub it with a grill brush and all of the crustiness from your last cooking episode just melts away. But these little tiny metal hairs 
break off. And if you ingest one, it can cause horrible issues. Our friend ended up having to have it surgically removed. She had months of health issues, lost tons of weight, and she is on a mission to teach people to use grill brushes that have one continuous wire so that the little wires don't break off and you don't ingest them and cause problems. I will link to the grill brush that I use in the show notes. It is a safety thing and I want people to stop using the regular grill brushes because I don't want anyone to accidentally ingest one. And it's so easy to happen. Google it. You'll totally see. It'll horrify you. And then go and buy this grill brush because the one that I have doesn't have little pieces. It just has one continuous wire and it works really well on the grill. You've heated up your grill. You've cleaned it with your safe grill brush. And then you put the patties on. I'm usually putting them on straight frozen. You're going to let them cook. If they're frozen, they're going to cook for about seven minutes at medium heat. So they've, all the burners have been on high heat. You're going to turn the burners down to medium heat, cook for seven minutes on one side, flip them, cook for five more minutes. If you want to top with some cheese or something, great. Your burgers are done. So that's kind of how to cook them on a gas grill. If you are pan frying them, this is a messy endeavor and your house is going to smell like burgers for days unless you have a really good hood but you can get this really nice, deep brown crust on your burgers. And sometimes that is the taste you are going for. And by golly, it is worth the mess. So here's tips on how to pan fry burgers. My son will pan fry one burger at like midnight and I can start smelling it in my sleep and I'll start dreaming of burgers. He is, that's one thing he makes late at night. You want to get a heavy skillet. If you have a cast iron skillet, that is the best. You want to heat it up on medium high heat until it is screaming hot. And then you want to add your burger patty and you want to put a splatter guard on top because it is going to sput and spatter fat all over unless you're using like 99% lean beef, which is going to give you a burger that's kind of dry. I wouldn't recommend it. Put a splatter guard on top to save yourself some of the cleanup. If you have an exhaust hood, make sure that you turn it on as high as it will go because this is going to create a lot of grease and a lot of mess in your kitchen if you don't have your exhaust hood going. You're going to let it sit in that skillet for at least five minutes and get that deep brown crust, kind of like when we were browning the hamburger before. Then flip it, let it cook for a couple minutes on the other side, and you end up with this crusty hamburger that is delicious. Now, while I am talking about hamburgers, we need to discuss the golf ball issue. Have you ever had a burger that looks like a beautiful patty and you go and you put it on the grill and it puffs up in the middle and it ends up more like a ball and it shrinks and it doesn't go to the edge of the bun and you've got this big, thick burger that's kind of hard to eat? My friends, that is a common issue with hamburgers and there are two really simple ways to deal with it. The first way is to make your patties extra wide and super thin. What happens when these hamburger patties turn into golf balls is the outside of the hamburger is starting to cook, but the inside isn't. And the proteins are shrinking on the outside and they're coming in, coming in. And the meat only has one place to go, which is to the center. And it puffs up in the center. If you make your hamburger patties extra thin and super wide, kind of like the ones that you buy pre-frozen in the grocery store, they will shrink up and you will end up with a thicker burger, but it's not going to be a golf ball. I usually make my make ahead hamburger patties and I make them extra wide and extra thin. And then they usually shrink in and get a little bit thicker and they make perfect hamburgers. The other way to do it is when you are making your patties, it can still be a little, it'll be a thicker patty and you just take your thumb and put a little divot in the center of the meat and you're going to have like a little hole there and it's going to fill with fat as the fat is rendered. Then eventually when you flip it, the meat is going to fill in that space and you're going to end up with a flat burger, but you're not going to end up with a burger that's like like a golf ball. Another thing about flipping burgers is when you flip them, do not take your spatula and push down on it 
because what you are doing is you are releasing all of the fat that is inside the proteins and you're going to end up with a very dry hamburger, which doesn't taste good. It's going to be dry and chalky. So let those juices stay inside. The juices are fat. Fat adds flavor. If you want less fat, then use a leaner meat, but still do not push down on it with your spatula, either when you are grilling them or pan frying them. The last kind of technique for cooking ground beef that we're going to talk about today is meatloaf and meatballs. And I touched on it a little bit earlier, but meatloaf and meatballs are usually some type of a panade. So you have a bread and a liquid, usually milk, and sometimes there's some eggs and other ingredients mixed in with the meat to bind it together or give it flavor. It's really key to have some type of a panade because it is going to give structure and it's going to give moisture to this meatloaf or the meatballs. Meatloaf and meatballs, by the way, are basically the same thing. It's just about how they're shaped and how they're cooked. My dairy-free meatballs, which I'll link to in the show notes, actually use water rather than milk for the panade. And I'm not using fresh bread. I'm using dried panko breadcrumbs. I have seen people do it with gluten-free breadcrumbs. So if you need to be gluten-free, you can make a gluten-free panade with either milk or water, and it still should come out pretty well. Some meatball recipes, especially there was an old pioneer woman recipe for these barbecue meatballs that had oatmeal in them. It's the same concept. You're mixing the oatmeal with the moisture of the water or the milk, and they're going to absorb and it's going to create moisture in the meatballs. When you are dealing with meatloaf or meatballs, the key is surface area. Surface area is what gives the meatloaf or meatballs that crust, which is the best part of the meatloaf or the meatballs. So when you are making a meatloaf, do not put it into a loaf pan because you're only going to get a little bit of crust on the very top because that is where the meat is exposed to the air of the oven. Make a freeform loaf and put it on a rimmed baking sheet and you're going to have a greater surface area, which is going to give you greater crust, which is going to make a better meatloaf. When you are doing meatballs, you basically take meatloaf mixture and you shape it into balls. And I am too lazy to shape it into balls. So I have a number 40 scoop and I use that to make the meatballs. If you do not have a number 40 scoop, I, it is an indispensable tool in my kitchen. It's linked in the show notes. I used it to make little lumps of my ginger garlic paste that I freeze. I use it to make cookies. I use it to make meatballs. It's the perfect size for my mini muffin tin. It is such a handy tool. And I'm not one about having a lot of extra kitchen gadgets, but my number 40 kitchen scoop is something that I use at least weekly, probably two to three times a week. When you are making the meatballs, you can cook them in one of two ways. You can cook them the Mary Sheldon way. Mary Sheldon is my mother. And when she makes meatballs, she individually fries each of the meatballs in a skillet. She puts maybe 12 in a skillet at a time. So there's lots of air around them and they get this big, thick, deep crust, but they're not particularly round, which doesn't bother me because that thick crust, again, the key is you let them cook and you don't touch them until the thick crust forms, then you flip them and you cook them on the other side and you cook them until they're cooked through. It is a messy endeavor. It makes wonderful meatballs, but I don't have time for it. So I like to cook mine in the oven and you can see the technique in my dairy-free Italian meatball recipe, but I basically scoop them and I put them onto a cookie sheet And then I bake them in the oven. If your oven has a convection feature where the air circulates, use that convection feature because it's going to create more air, which is going to get you a slightly thicker crust on those meatballs. That is the easiest way to cook meatballs. Friends, this is a really long podcast. I'm looking at my timer and I can't believe I've talked a half an hour about how to cook ground beef. But I think that there are some key techniques that we can all learn from as we kind of dig in deeper to make small little tweaks to our cooking techniques that make our food taste just a little bit better or make our lives just a little bit easier. So I want to know in the Feed Your Family Tonight Facebook group, 
If you learned anything from this episode, or if you said, yeah, I do that, that must be why my food tastes so good. I want to hear it in the Feed Your Family Tonight Facebook group. Join me there. For now, friends, I hope you have a great week. Take care.